Hey everybody, welcome back to another study in the Gospel of Luke. I've got my sparkling water in hand, my LaCroix. This, I had to look up how this was pronounced, you know, because it looks like it's French, like La Croix or something fancy, but it's actually just LaCroix, and it's not, it's not French at all. It's named after uh, like a river in Wisconsin. That's according to their own website. So most, you know, the general consensus on this whenever someone sees me drinking it is that it's absolutely disgusting. I know there are a few LaCroix fans out there though, so if you're a LaCroix fan, leave a comment down below. If you're a LaCroix hater, let me know that as well. Mm. It helps me drink less Coke Zero. That's why I drink it. Anyway, let's get in. Let's get into our study. We're in uh, Luke chapter one. Grab the notes online if you haven't already. There's a, a free copy there, but also if you want a hard copy that you can make notes in yourself and correct all my errors, then you can grab a hard copy on Amazon.com. Both of the links are down in the description below. Do you remember where we left off? We were introduced to a couple characters, Herod, he was in charge of Judea at the time, and then Zachariah and Elizabeth. We talked about how Zachariah was one of the priests and he was, they had a problem. This couple had a problem. The problem was that they were old and they didn't have any kids and they were sad about that. But God was going to come through and answer or give them a solution to their problem. And at the same time, he was going to use the solution to further his will and what he was doing in the world. So that brings us to verse 8. Let's read 8, eight through 10. Now while he, or Zechariah, was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. So it was Zechariah's turn to serve in the, in the temple. And on this particular day, he was selected to be the guy who offered the sacrifice of incense. We'll talk about that in a second and, and talk about what that is exactly. But let's first talk about the temple complex. I know we talked about it a little bit in a previous video, but it, it's helpful if you have the notes to see the pictures and the diagrams that are there to get a better concept of kind of where we're talking about and what exactly was going on here. In the notes, page 22, the uh, first picture there is of the like the temple proper, like the outer court, and then the actual building where a lot of the holy things were kept, including the Ark of the Covenant. That picture actually comes from a tiny model of Jerusalem that's built. It, it's somewhere over in Israel, and a lot of people have taken pictures of it. So that's not a life-sized shot. The temple no longer is standing there. But that's a picture of the tiny tiny replica. And then down below it, I kind of drew a diagram of what it would look if you were looking down into that actual building. There were two major rooms in the temple itself, the holy place and then the most holy place. And they were divided by a curtain. Uh, the, the most holy place was super special and a priest, one priest, the high priest, could only go in there one time a year. But Every day, a regular priest would enter the holy place and offer this sacrifice of incense. And you can see it kind of written small there, but the altar of incense where this incense was burned was right in front of the curtain that divided the holy place from the most holy place. So that's where Zechariah was going to go in order to make this, make this offering. I have a little diagram also on page 23. Uh, that masterpiece was drawn by yours truly. Uh, <laughs> you can read about the altar of incense in Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. It was made of a wood called acacia wood. It was overlaid with gold, so it would have been pretty cool looking. It wasn't very big, though. It was one cubit wide. A cubit's about 18 inches. One cubit wide, one cubit um, deep. And then it was about two cubits tall, so only three feet tall. So this wasn't, you know, some kind of spectacular altar necessarily, other than it being gold. It was, it was rather small in size, but it served the purpose. And no one was really going to see this altar except the priests anyway, because it was inside the temple, and the people, the regular people, weren't allowed uh, inside of the temple. Incense was offered on it every day morning and evening. And it had a couple rings on the side of it so that when 
well, back in the day before the temple was a permanent structure, they had what was called the tabernacle, and they would tran it was a, a tent, and uh, they would transport these altars and the holy items around, and they were uh, transported transported by the priests by poles. So that gives you a little bit better idea of what was going on and kind of puts you a little bit more in the scene of the events here. Zechariah got chosen this particular day to offer this sacrifice by lot. Now, we don't exactly know what it, the, the process of casting lots, but it appears several times in the Bible. It seems like just a process of random selection, almost like drawing straws or rolling dice. But we also know that God providentially decided the outcome and miraculously decided the outcome of some of the... Um, uh, sorry, I'm distracted. There's a helicopter flying by my house. I live on Gu I live on Guam, which is an island in the Pacific, and there's a big military presence here. And you might be able to hear it. But there's an Air Force base, and then there's a Navy base, and there's fighter jets and uh, helicopters and just all kinds of things <laughs> flying around all the time classified airplanes. Where were we? Oh, sometimes God determined the outcome of the lot that was cast, and this is one of those occasions. You might be able to think of some other times when that happened. If you know the story of Jonah, you know, the men on the ship were trying to decide who was at fault for the storm and all the damage that was being done, and they cast lots, and it was Jonah. I believe they also cast lots when it when it came to selecting a new apostle in Acts chapter 1. And God guided that process and used it for his purpose. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 33 says that the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So this time, as we'll find out in a few verses, this was another time when God determined the outcome. And he specifically sent Zechariah into the temple that day because he was going to have a very unique encounter. I would definitely encourage you to get the notes for this next part because there's going to be pictures of all of the ingredients that went into this incense. It's interesting that uh, the recipe is given for this in Exodus chapter 30 verses 30 uh, verse 34. The Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, stacti and oncha and gal <laughs> Galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense of each, shall there be an equal part, and make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. We've got all the ingredients if you want to make some ancient temple burning incense, but you've got to figure out what they were first. So stacti was a resin or the gum that came out of the myrrh tree. This oncha, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right, O-N-Y-C-H-A. The identity of that is debated. Some people think that it is actually made up, of, it's made by smashing sea snail, sea, sea, sea snail shells. Uh, and, and some of these are found in the Red Sea and other places. Other people think that it is the gum or the resin out of the cystus plant. And again, photos in the notes. Galbanum is another type of resin that comes from the ferula tree. And then frankincense comes from the frankincense tree. So they went around and collected all of these things and they combined them together to make this incense. And it was uh, something that smelled good and they burned it every morning and every evening on the altar inside of the temple. The text seems to indicate here that this was a period of time when all of the, well, a large gathering of people would gather at the temple to pray. It might be the same as the hour of prayer that's mentioned in the uh, beginning chapters of Acts. I can't remember off the top of my head which chapters those are, but Peter and John go to the temple at the hour of prayer, I believe, and they heal a lame man there. I think that's um, Acts chapter 3. It might be the same. I'm not exactly sure. That would be something you can dig into. Let's read verses 11 and 12. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Zechariah was going about his business, making this offering that he had probably made several times in his life. And an angel appeared to the right of the altar, which would have been pretty close to him. 
And it says that uh, he, was, he was terrified. Now, Zechariah would have been the only one to see this angel because he was the only one in the temple at the time, at least as far as we know. And the appearance of the angel struck fear into Zechariah. This is probably the most common response to seeing an angel in the Bible. It was frightening and, and terrifying and probably overwhelming to see these beings. We don't exactly know what they look like, <clears throat> excuse me, looked like, but apparently they weren't those like, you know, cute little baby angels with wings, because <laughs> I don't think anyone would be terrified of most of the angels that we see in our, our modern art. If you've ever read the first couple chapters of the book of Ezekiel and you read about the angels there, you know, these were very unique beings, not anything like what we would have, uh, what we would imagine if we went off of pop culture. And they also appeared in different forms at different times. We know that. So there's not really any way to tell exactly what this angel would have looked like. But angels, just in general, worked as messengers and servants of God. And now let's go through the largest section of what we're going to cover in this video, verses 13 through 17. But the angel said to him, Zechariah, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will, re re will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the obedient to the wisdom of the just, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So although Zechariah was really terrified when he saw this angel, uh, it didn't take long to realize that he wasn't there to do him any harm. He was actually there to bring him good news. Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayer about having a child was going to be answered. They were going to have a son, and they were supposed to name him John. And he was going to have a really, really special, uh, a truly unique role of any of God's servants. Uh, he was going to be kind of the one and only uh, person to uh, prepare the way for the Messiah. He was supposed to abstain from wine, and that was a pretty common thing for Jews who had dedicated themselves to God. The text also says that he was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we need to kind of talk about who the Holy Spirit is. You've probably heard about uh, the term the Trinity or the Godhead, maybe. And that's the kind of the concept that there are three beings who share the characteristics of God. There's God the Father. God the Son, Jesus, and then there's the Holy Spirit, or uh, the Spirit of God. And, and again, they're referred to as the Godhead, or the Trinity. And each of those beings have a, played a unique role in the salvation of mankind, and in the story that we're about to read about and we will read about in other books. The Holy Spirit definitely plays a big role in the book of Acts, which we'll study next. In the Bible, we commonly see the Holy Spirit empowering God's servants uh, to accomplish the things that God wants them to do and, and gives them a supernatural ability to do that. But that's, especially, that's how we see him working in the, the Old Testament <clears throat> and in some of the New. John would be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Okay, we just mentioned that. I reread my same note. <clears throat> John's job was going to be to announce the arrival of the Messiah. You might be like, I have no idea what a Messiah is. A Messiah, or the Messiah, or the Anointed One, uh, was a Jewish, almost hero figure, who was prophesied by God's prophets to come to deliver the Jewish people, to save the Jewish people. <clears throat> there was a lot of debate about exactly how that saving was going to be accomplished and what the Jews needed saved from. A lot of the rabbis and the scribes and the Jewish religious teachers taught that the Messiah was going to come and he was going to be like a political military leader and he was going to save the Jews from a political, political oppression. 
system. So Rome was in charge at the time. They basically ruled the world. And the idea was that if the Messiah came during the Roman Empire, that he was going to free them from Rome and throw them, throw off their oppressors and basically make the Jewish nation very prominent again on the world stage. But there was a lot of misunderstanding there, and it was a misinterpretation of the Old Testament scriptures to take that interpretation, but it was very popular. God's intentions with the Messiah were very different. He was actually going, planning to save his people from a much greater enemy, the, the worst enemy that a person could have. And that wasn't the Romans, that was Satan and the devil. And he was going to save them from the consequences of their disobedience to him. The Jews, for a long, long time, had been unfaithful to God, for the most part, even though God had been very faithful to them. And he was going to offer them a way to be reconciled to him, uh, to be forgiven of all their past wrongs. And we'll find out a lot more about that and, and the way that God wanted to use this Messiah figure as we go throughout the book. <clears throat> to the Jews, they thought the Messiah was an earthly figure, but God, um, or an earthly deliverer, but God intended him to be a spiritual deliverer. John's special job was going to be to prepare the way for the Messiah, or to, to announce the arrival of the Messiah. He was going to prep the people, and, and this was a big deal. I mean, the Messiah was a huge character uh, among the, the Jews, and they were hotly anticipating him because of some prophecies that had been made back in the Old Testament where they you know, were kind of sorting through them and thinking that the Messiah might arrive sometime around then. And you know, they were right. So this was a big deal. The Messiah is coming, and John's job is going to be to announce his imminent arrival. The Holy Spirit was going to give him the details of that, because he didn't know that in and of himself, but God was going to reveal it to him. And John's preaching would cause a lot of people to rejoice. I mean, this was, this was something the Jews were looking forward to. And there was going to be a lot of Jews who turned to God in a... In, well, they, they were going to, uh, yeah, turn their lives over to God. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, turn their lives over to God and, and be... be <laughs> something's not firing properly in my brain. They were going to give their lives to God and wanted, they wanted to do what God wanted them to do because of the preaching of John. He was going to tell them that, that God was at work and they were going to say, okay, great, what do I need to, to do to get on board? Uh, and just kind of a spoiler alert, uh, Jesus is the Messiah. So you, I think I already mentioned that, and you might have already figured that out. But Jesus is the Messiah figure. In verse 17, the angel told Zechariah that John was going to go, and he was going to go uh, in, in the spirit and power of Elijah. That's how he was going to preach. He was going to accomplish his work in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And you probably have the question, well, Who's Elijah? I'd never heard of that guy before. <clears throat> Elijah was one of God's prophets in the Old Testament. He lived a good long time before Luke ever wrote his gospel or Jesus ever stepped on the earth. But you, you can actually read about him in uh, 1 Kings chapter... Well, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, kind of all over some of those books, those chapters. There was a prophecy in the Jewish scriptures in the book of Malachi that said that God would send Elijah before the Messiah arrived. And let me read you that verse. It's Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. So when the angel was talking to Zechariah, some of his wording was taken from this prophecy in Malachi 4. Now, in what sense was Elijah going to come back? You know, is he going to resurrect from the dead or come, come down from heaven and reappear on the earth after hundreds and hundreds of years? Well, a lot of the Jews thought so, um, but that wasn't God's intention. You can see there's a lot of differences between what the Jews kind of expected and what they, what they got uh, around the time that the Messiah arrived. But a lot of the Jewish rabbis and teachers taught that that was exactly what was going to happen. Elijah was going to come down from heaven and walk on the earth again, but that wasn't God's intention. His intention was for, for a man to preach 
in the spirit and the power of Elijah, in the likeness of the way that Elijah taught. And that character was John. Jesus kind of clarifies that when uh, it comes up in Matthew chapter 17, verse 10. The disciples ask him a question about this, because they had probably been in their synagogues and heard their rabbis and scribes teach about Elijah's coming. And they said, uh, they asked Jesus, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? They're they're trying to get some clarification about what's going on, and he goes on to tell them that uh, John is the one who fills that role as the man who comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah. As we kind of close out here, let's work through one of the statements that the angel makes. He says back in verse 17, Uh, This is part of that quote from Malachi. And he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. What What does the angel mean? What does this prophecy mean about turning the hearts of the fathers to the children? Who are the fathers and who are the children? There's some debate about what this means, but I have... The, uh, my, my best understanding is that the fathers that are mentioned here are a reference back to the patriarchs or the fathers of the Jewish nation. Some of those guys that we talked about back in um, our last video, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, da- uh, David, he comes a little bit later, but these were the fathers of their nation, just like we talk about sometimes the founding fathers of the nation of the United States, right? Similar, but um, the founding fathers of Judaism were Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and they were all very pretty faithful men, and they were highly regarded, and, and God speaks of them with high regard, and the Jews thought of them in high regard. So I think that's, the, that's who's mentioned here as the fathers. And the fathers are... Uh, The fathers were very faithful to God, but their children, their descendants, the Jews, especially the Jews who were living right then and in the first century, uh, and especially at the end of the Old Testament, had they been as faithful to God as their fathers? Eh, No. (laughs) And God makes that clear all throughout the end of the Old Testament, that they've left the pattern that their fathers set for them. So, you know, when a, when a father looks at his son and sees that he's taken a disappointing route, right, there's some disappointment there. There's some, uh, uh, you know, the son kind of let down their fathers. And the example that the father set wasn't followed by the son. And so there's, uh, there needs to be some reconciliation or um, just disappointment. And their, the hearts of the fathers might be turned away from their children because they have disobeyed. Well... These disobedient children are going to be given an opportunity to repent and to have their sins forgiven and to be reconciled to God. And what would that do to, you know, the patriarchs, how would they look at that? Well, their hearts would be turned back to their children. They would look at their children with affection that they had gone astray for a long, long time, but eventually they came back to God. And through John and through the Messiah, God was going to set up a way for the Jews to be forgiven and to return to him, even though they had been so wicked. So I think that's kind of the idea of the, the fathers of the Jewish nation. They would, their hearts would be given a reason to rejoice at the repentance of some of their children and and. They would rejoice in the fact that their children were following their example of being obedient to God. Kind of like the parable of the prodigal son. You know, there's the, the father who's faithful, who's a, he's a good father, and his, his younger son uh, turns away from him and kind of spurns him and leaves. Well, the, the father's heart is filled with affection for his son when his son returns and asks for forgiveness, and there's a reconciliation there. I think that's kind of the idea that's, that's being expressed. I think this is a text that really highlights the importance of having some knowledge of the Old Testament in order to understand the New Testament, because we've just jumped back to Elijah, we've jumped back to this prophecy in the book of Malachi, we've talked about the history of the Jews and you know, what their behavior was and whether they were obedient to God or not, and all that information comes from the Old Testament, so that stuff's definitely not irrelevant. But we have done a lot of jumping around for the sake of understanding those 
the words of the angel. So let's kind of wrap this up and take away like three key points from what we've really talked about, three highlights. The three highlights that I've got written here are Zachariah and Elizabeth were going to have a son. It was the solution to their problem, and it was going to be the solution, or part of the solution to all of the Jews' problems. Point number two, their son would be dedicated to the Lord, and he was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then number three, he would announce the arrival of the Savior, the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One. So we'll discuss John's work a little bit further in chapter 3. But those are kind of the, the main takeaways here if you just want the big picture. Well, all right, that's another day down. We made, it, we made it through like page 28. We only got 700 more to go. Well, I'm going to sit here, drink my LaCroix, and uh, probably edit this video now and cut out all of my mistakes.